Thanks for having me, Uslan. Appreciate it. Um, in 1980, I was a, an exchange student to Montana State University, which is in Western United States in the North and a cold place in the Rocky Mountains. And when I was there come spring break, two weeks off for college, I didn't want to go back to my home on the East Coast. I wanted to go on an adventure. And so I found a person who wanted to go on an adventure and he had one planned and his adventure was to go into Canada to British Columbia and Alberta in March with about 10 feet of snow on the ground and a couple of days drive from the Arctic Circle to go on a 10 day snow caving back country ice climb, uh, cross country ski trip ice climb. The ice climb was only a single day, but the the backcountry trip was seven or eight days of living in snow caves and digging our way and cross-country cross cross skiing. So I'd been a mountain person most of my life, certainly an outdoor wilderness person since I was a kid, and camping every season, Boy Scouts and winter camping and summer camping and backpacking in the mountain ranges and all sorts of stuff all my life. And this was my natural habitat, although it was extreme. And it was the, I'd spent a fair amount of time in wilderness areas, deep, deep wilderness areas, months even, uh, all told. But I'd never been to this particular depth of the wilderness in the middle of the winter for such an extended period of time. It was an expedition for two. And we prepared, we were well prepared for all of it, except for I wasn't well prepared for the ice climb. So I, I recognize my youthful bravado. Um, I was 21 years old. I had just had my birthday and I was uh, in pain. I had emotional pain, some wounding from my, my childhood. My sister had run away and from our point of view vanished and it broke my family. And, and that's why I was in Montana in the first place was to get away and why I was not going back to Boston uh, Mm -hmm. for that break. I was, and done with that kind of suffering for then. And so I went on this adventure and everything was great. Uh, this, th- when one is in the wilderness, one learns in the, in the winter and the, in the wilds, one learns to trust their partner. Mm-hmm. And so Tim and I developed a very deep trust of each other's skills and, and, um, capabilities and, um, I guess the most important thing was besides those skills and capabilities, the level headedness of each other, because during that previous week, we encountered some, what could have potentially, and I haven't talked a lot about the things that happened to us that week, because they're not nearly as exciting about what happened to us on the mountain, but there were some potentially hazardous things that happened to us. Mm. So I trusted him with my life Mm. that entire week as he trusted me. So we get to the ice climb, which is the end of our our trip. It's a one day ice climb. I'd never ice climbed before. I'd I'd been uh, rock climbing and and mount, I climbed a lot of mountains. I had a lot of rock climbing and ropes and ropes since I was a kid uh, with Boy Scouts. And I'm doing this because that's that's an imaginary rope in my hands. Um, So rope and, um, but I didn't have all the equipment. Tim came from a wealthy family and he had just completed his certification class course, rather course in ice climbing. I had never ice climbed in my life and I didn't have all the gear. So I borrowed and rented what I could. And I had almost all the gear. I came up short one piece of equipment. It's essential. I only had one ax and, and I had a hammer and a hammer is like an ax, except for it's significantly shorter and you, you grip it and the, and the top is here. And on the ice ax, you grip it and the top is up here. And that means every time you swing this ax, you have a much longer reach, which means your climb is faster if you, unless you're using a hammer, because then you, you're short on every single swing, uh, like 18 inches or something like that. In addition to that, the ax has a way when you set it in the ice and you put the bottom pick in, you can release your hand because the strap that's attached to the ax with a little bead holding it in can keep your hand here so you don't have to grip it with your forearm the whole time because there's a lot of this is serious physical exercise and and if you're doing this one thing gripping all the time pretty soon your muscles get tired mm. exhausted and that's what i had to do with the axe pardon me the hammer mm. i couldn't ever let go of the hammer i had to grip it the whole time because it was so small i couldn't set it in the ice and this the strap for the hammer was on the bottom 
because it was a hammer and it was meant to dangle on my on my waist belt mm. so that I could then take it off because it had a carabiner on it and chip the ice or take out an ice screw or put it in an ice screw. That's what this purpose was. You can climb with it. And I, I guess Tim and I talked a lot about it. He was trying to help me find an axe too. We were in Bozeman, Montana. There weren't a lot of axes available to me and I didn't have a lot of money. So I was a college student, so I couldn't buy any gear. And, and so I got the one axe in the outing club and the one hammer and the outing club. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about whether I could make the climb with this. And we decided that we would try it. And and I think that I was the one who pushed that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think looking back on it. So we get to the climb that day. It's about 70. Uh, no, I should put it in, in meters. It's probably uh, 100 meters from the Icefields Parkway. Mm -hmm. And it, which means that there's a parking lot. Mm -hmm. And the, the Icefields Parkway is a very beautiful road in Western Canada, and it's very isolated. And on this road, just off of it, is a world-famous ice climb called Lower Weeping Wall mm -hmm. on a mountain called Cirrus, which is a, a cloud formation. And so we get to the climb, and there was a bunch of other climbers on the, on the climb that day, and, and we were the last people there. And I knew going into this that I had less equipment than I needed. So we began the climb and it went, the climb was, climb went well. I climbed well, Tim climbed well. And climbing is this, I should set the scene. This is 10 feet of snow on the ground. There's an ice wall at the bottom of a, of a mountain that I, I, I'm going to guess today, 12,000 foot mountain, mm -hmm. but, but we're not going 12,000 feet up. We're only going five or 600 feet up, but it's an ice wall mm -hmm. and it's the middle of March, and, which means it's deep winter. Mm -hmm. and so we get to the ice wall and we're the last team to begin to climb and we climb and climbing is, the, is an intensity of focus. Climbing is paying attention to exactly where you are and what you're doing and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Not uh, paying attention to looking down. That gets, that brings, that's a, if you're afraid of heights that you don't look down, you stay in the space where you are and you think about the things right around you and what, and every move that you have to make and everything that you have to do in order to stay where you are and move upward. So it's hyper, it's a hyper focus sport. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have, uh, I have ADHD. Hyper focus is my, is one of my superpowers. And so being hyper focused in this space, I could do that. But my climb was extraordinarily slow for the, because of the reach of the hammer versus the ax um, and the ax versus the hammer and the um, gripping. Mm -hmm. So by the, within hours of our arrival at the top of this climb, uh, we knew we were in deep trouble and I couldn't go any faster because I was, ex my arms were exhausted. Yeah. And so I had to rest a lot in order to swing that next one and hang on to that next one. And, and you always have to, in climbing, you have to have three points of contact. Mm. So it's either two hand, you have your two hands and your two feet, any one of those, any three of those, and so there's not a lot of rest for arms. So by the time we actually reached the top, we already knew that we were in a deadly situation. Mm -hmm. And we watched the last team exit. And they, I, I remember looking down and the sun's going down and this, this guy's like, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, but his arms were wide and his, exp his, his expression was huge. And um, I, I, I think that he's the one who told the ranger to come the warden to come look for us yeah. but i don't know that for sure but we pulled up the rope and the rope was a double line and it uh, was 150 feet so each pitch is 100 feet you have extra extra climb line so that if you have 50 extra feet so the th whole thing is 300 feet long and and and, and it, it piled into a big huge knot and which which during which the sun went down and the temperature dropped about 30 degrees almost instantaneously, like a, like a, a wall of cold descended as the sun went down and violent shivers racked our body in a, in a, in a way that is, that makes one unable to move well. Cause the whole thing, every muscle is pulsing and it's uh, tensing. And, uh, and against each other in this violent way with a clattering jaw. And, and my, my climbing partner, Tim, was in the same situation I was in. And, and we, we knew 
as Tim hauled up the rope and he hauled it up too fast and, 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 and it became a, a, a knot and, and it was just the first of our mistakes I threw that we made through the night that eventually killed me. And I, I can tell the whole story, but I'm going to, I'm going to speed through the, the trauma of the night. I'll tell certain parts of it, but the, it, it was, I die, I froze to death. And, and that involved a whole series of stages that I went, my body went through as we were fighting against the cold, the, the, and the coming of death, the height we were at and the, and our own exhaustion and lack of food. And so all these factors were pressing on us throughout the entire night. Mm -hmm. But while we were, while we were deciding what to do, we, we considered staying put where we were because one of the first rules of wilderness experience you're taught, I learned this when I was 11 years old in the Boy Scouts, that if you get lost in the woods, you stay where you are. Yeah. That's it. You stay where you are. You don't go wandering off. You stay in one place. And that's a hard, fast rule, which was what we discussed. We should stay exactly where we are so that they can find us with ease if they need to and, and or if they're able to. And but we decided that our hypothermia was already too far advanced. We were we were wet to the skin, and I didn't have this is 1980s, so I didn't have any high tech gear. This was all wool. I had one I had one piece of new material called polypropylene, but everything else was was like wool, wool and leather basically. And um, so we talked about snuggling together for warmth, and decided that if we did, we would die. Yeah. And that, that we knew, we knew that we were going to die and that knowing we were going to die, we had a choice. We could stay where we were and die, or we could fight to get off the mountain and die and maybe get off the mountain. Yeah. But neither of us really believed that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the odds in front of us were daunting. It was, it was dark. It was starlit. There were, there were 10 zillion stars in the sky. Uh, if, if you've ever been, you, you, I know that you live in the city, but if you've ever been anywhere where there are, where there's no light at all, mm -hmm. that's this place. Mm -hmm. And so the, the sky was starlit with the, with the galaxy, our galaxy, right, you know, sweeping across. And this, so there was enough illumination to see, but not enough really to see color. It was all black and white and, and shadowy because it's starlight. And so there's that, there's the cold, there's the drop because there's the drop all night long, we could fall. Mm. So we make this traverse. We have three rappels to go to get to the bottom. Our tent is in the car across the street in the parking lot. And so we have three rappels to go and throughout the night, um, the, Cold continued to increase. Our coordin our lack of coordination continued to increase. We continued, to, or our coordination continued to decline. Mm -hmm. Our capacity for reasoning continued to decline because our brains were freezing. Our ability to speak was limited because our faces were freezing. I still have all my digits, but I have, I have, I have problems. This this night has never let me escape. I have physical ramifications from this night, and they're all over my body. And so I never ever forget mm -hmm. that, that that physically that this thing happened to me. So uh, I our hands were freezing, our eyeballs were freezing, our brains were freezing, so we weren't making good choices. And so we fought our way down. We had mishaps. We made mistakes. And we kept fighting our way and and driving ourselves forward with willpower. So I I, I was stripped away of all other concerns. I it, we talked I talked about a little bit about single mindedness and climbing. This became a single minded focus of survival. And there was this period of time just before the top of the second rappel, where suddenly instead of willing myself forward and i was terrified okay so this, so oh, i forgot to mention the fear so i i was completely terrified of dying and and no knowing that um that i really didn't know what, what waited me on the other side and so i was driving myself forward with my willpower but there came this place inside of me with it predates the way it felt to me was animalistic it predates my hominin self. Mm -hmm. It predates my 
you know, my ancestor who walked the savanna self, or maybe it was in that that ancestor on the savanna and the plains of Africa, but it was deeper than that. It was way deeper than that. It it predated. It felt reptilian to me, or or uh, you know, ancient, ancient part of my brain, an ancient part of my brain engaged that I didn't know that I had, and I became purely about survival only. I I don't know how to um, talk about this place inside my brain. I've never been back to that place, but it's left for me uh, a capacity for forward motion mm. to drive myself forward. I've never, I've never reached the bottom of my willpower mm. since that night. Mm. I've always found, I'm always able to muster up more willpower because I have kind of expanded my willpower capacity or, or I found this thing inside of myself that uh, powered me. Mm. So all through the night, I had this terror. I was repressing as the fine, as the cold was continuing to uh, burn mm. and, and cold is fire. So if you've ever put your hand on an ice block and you left it on the ice block, it burns. Mm -hmm. And that, in, in that, this kind of circumstance, the fire was inside. Mm -hmm. So my feet were on fire. My hands were on fire. My head was on fire. Everything was burning. Everything was difficult to move. It was hard to actually move my lips. Every action of my arm and my feet and my hands and my, my focus, I had to control every action because it was not working right. The whole system was lost, had lost coordination and it was, and the muscle, just moving the muscles. I was so cold. It was hard to move the muscles. Yeah. If you've ever swum in a very cold ocean and you, I don't know if you've ever been in a very, very cold ocean where, where, where you can't, um, you're like, I'm, I'm in here too long and my legs aren't kicking anymore. Kind of, that's the kind of situation. And so, we get to the final repel. Mm. And in this final repel, our, our hypothermia is advanced. Mm. And for the first time of the night, we're, we're physically safe from falling because mm. the mountain has iron pins mm. epoxied into the mountain with rings and carabiners clicked in and straps that, mm. that click to a carabiner on my harness. So for the first time, I'm not going to fall. And it's a good thing too, because um, I actually fell a whole series of times as I died mm. and I would have fallen off the cliff had I not been clipped in. Mm. So I had the rope, Tim came down first and he went around the corner as there's this corner. We came down this rappel and around this corner onto this ledge and I, he was here and I was there. And so I, and the corner was here and I had the rope and he was off to the side and we weren't really talking a lot. Mm. We were because talking took energy. And the other thing we we're up, we were up against when I talked about the food, no food to, was our own energy level. Mm -hmm. So uh, the body in a hypothermic state is consuming a lot of energy just to try to stay warm baseline. Mm -hmm. If you stay still, your body is still trying to consume all these calories, but we're also moving forward and we're thinking. And mm -hmm. so we have these three different things um, eating down on us, eating the, the remaining energy inside us. And I didn't have any, I was a, I was a kid. I didn't have any fat at all. I was Mr. Skinny Bones, and I and and I had muscles, and it felt like the like the muscles were being eaten, mm -hmm. and by my own body at the toward the end. And I was standing there with the rope, and Tim was to my left, and I took one end of the rope and I tied it to my harness, very with great difficulty because it was hard to move my hands. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm trying not to be, I'm not trying not to freak out. You know, both of us kept level heads through this whole thing. And one of the rules of survival in the wilderness is. Yes, you, if you if you panic, you die. That's mm -hmm. it. So no panic. And we both knew this, the, the pressure of the circumstance kept us both on our game. Mm -hmm. So I tied the rope off to my harness. I took the other end of the rope. And I tossed it out around this, this corner. And, and I pull, give it a little pull to pull it down through the ring that was up above. And it jammed in some kind of rock mm -hmm. around the corner up in the dark. And I couldn't get it free. And now we can't descend because I can't get the rope and I can't reascend because I only ha have half the rope. Mm. And so now we're stuck on this cliff and no matter how much I pulled, I couldn't get the rope free and I couldn't flick it free. I couldn't, nothing I could do. Mm. And meanwhile, the hypothermia continues to advance and, and there are stages. And I, sh I should add that at this, that since I was in high school, mm -hmm. um, since I was in, 
I don't know what grade, ninth, ninth or 10th grade. Uh, I was on the national, I was a volunteer and a paid patroller on the national ski patrol. Mm -hmm. So I was trained in first aid. Mm -hmm. And, and at this particular year, I was working at a, at a mountain in Montana on the, as a volunteer. And so I was the first aid guy on the trip. Um, and so I knew the stages of hypothermia and I told him, you know, I, 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 I wanted him to know, and I wanted to know where we were at. So we, we could kind of gauge ourselves as we went along through the night. So we got to this point where I got hot mm -hmm. and all of the, all of the blood rushed from my, well, this is what it felt like to me. All of the, it felt like all the blood rushed from my extremities into my core. And I remember thinking to myself very logically, oh yeah, I don't need my feet. Mm -hmm. I can live without, all I need is really my heart and my brain and my lungs, really. I can live without all the rest of that stuff. My arms, um, my feet had since stopped burning. Mm -hmm. They were beyond that stage. The nerves were beyond their ability to carry a signal. And I unzipped my coat, which I knew better because I was on the ski patrol. He, people who die from hypothermia exposure often are naked. Yeah. And they're naked because they suddenly feel hot. And so they open up their clothes, and which speeds death. Mm. And so I zip, unzip my coat and, and I, cause, and I, cause I got so hot and Tim yelled at me and I, blew, I said, enough, I'm leaving my coat open. I'm too hot. And, and then I realize that I'm going to die here, that this is my, this is it. And so I start thinking about my family start thinking about God. I start thinking about death and I'm in a, I'm in a most beautiful place. It is, I can, I, I know it's March, but, the, but some rivers run right underneath the snow and this river, we could hear the, we could hear it running under the snow and, and the, I, the Columbia ice fields were just on the other side. And so there was brilliant mountain scape. The moon had risen. And so we could see in color you know, like a three quarter moon, we could see a lot of light. And um, it was really, really beautiful. And and at this point, I went from this desperate person trying to survive to an accepting person recognizing my death. And I, 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 I in some sense, I gave up, mm. but it didn't feel like giving up to me. It felt like um, acceptance to me acceptance of a reality that I could not change. And with the acceptance of this reality that I had no power over, this peace descended on me. And I began to think about my sister who had vanished when I was a kid and a teenager and, and how it broke my family and how my mom continued to mourn for my sister who was not dead, but not whose whereabouts was unknown. And so there was this ongoing grief that never had any sort of capacity for moving beyond the initial loss. Yeah. And so that was always present. And, and I thought, oh, now they're going to lose me. Mm -hmm. And what's it going to do to them? Mm -hmm. And how's it going to break them? Mm -hmm. And they didn't want me on the trip in the first place. Mm -hmm. So then I began to fall asleep. I kept pulling on the rope because I you know, wanted to get off the mountain. Yeah. So I kept pulling on the rope, but I started to fall asleep. And when I fall asleep, I would fall. Yeah. I would collapse and sleep would come like a, like a curtain drop, bang, or a door slamming from light to darkness. And my mind would go dark and my body would collapse and smack my head and my shoulder on the cliff, had a helmet and um, stood back up and continued pulling and fall asleep. And, and then I stood back up and and as I stood back up, I had tunnel vision. And this tunnel vision was like a big black dark circle around the extremity of what I could see. I had never seen this before. And 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 so as I as I looked around, it got smaller and smaller and smaller. And 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 it got so small. And as it got down to this, I could see just like this. Um, as it got down to about that size, I thought to myself, oh, I must be falling asleep again but this is really weird. I'd never seen anything like it. It was very unexpected. And it went, and when it went to black, mm. I was aware that I was still conscious. Mm. And I thought to myself, okay, I saw that go black, but I'm still awake. Why am I awake? And then I realized that all in front of me was a darkness that I could see. 
and this darkness that I could see had depth to it, although it was dark. And then I thought to myself, I, I am not in pain. Why am I not in pain? And I thought, wow, this is confusing to me. And as I looked out, I wondered where the mountain was. Like, where's the mountain now? I've lost the mountain. And, and as I looked in the direction that I was facing, I saw this little tiny pinprick of like a star, one star and a black night. And, and, it, and it, it appeared and it came rushing toward me across this vast space faster than the speed of light. It filled this, the depth of the distance. I, I, could, I, I understood its speed and its distance and its depth. And as it came toward me, it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and filled my horizon and filled my vision with itself. And as it came right at me, I, I, I said, I'm not going anywhere. It communicated to me, I'm taking you. I'm like, I am, I don't understand what's going on, but I'm staying right where I am. And so then I reached down inside myself and I tried to put up my shield again. And, and it communicated to me even before it got to me, it communicated to me as it took me all power with a capital P, all strength, all intelligence, all ability, all uh, magnificence. And, and it reached and took me and I was incapable of resistance and it enveloped me inside itself. And, and it, and I was inside it and I was an, like in an orb of, of light of, of consciousness. And it was speaking to me without language. This was all happening without language and everything I'm saying is in metaphor because I'm in a, I, I don't even have a brain anymore, let alone language or concepts to think about them. And so this thing, this entity, I know this entity, this entity is the enti the same angelic being that I've known my whole life. And only now it's, it's my connection to my human self is severed. Mm -hmm. And the other encounters I'd had with this being, I, my connection to my human self remained intact, mm -hmm. always had a way back to my body, but now it's gone. And I am now inside of this entity, and I am a being of light. I, I have a shape, and my shape is like a human, but it doesn't have any cells to it. It has no molecular structure to it. It's more like a, a conglomeration or collection of photons. Mm -hmm. And I am, a, I am a being of light with some kind of humanoid shape, and I am inside this most comfortable place I've ever been, mm -hmm. speaking comfort and love and power and might write to me. And I'm inside of this and I'm being carried up the direct, the same route, tunnel, elevator shaft direction it had come from. And it, it, it was moving at a rapid pace and I could see out of it, it was transparent and I could still see this uh, velvety void of darkness that extended in every direction. And I would had a I was it was superpositioned, mm -hmm. so it was it was independent, an independent, all powerful entity, much greater than I was, mm -hmm. and yet it was subservient to. That's not quite the right word. Part of a mm -hmm. portion of the much larger infinite being that was the same as it, and it was in a limited form, which was infinitely greater than me, was in a limited form in order to collect me and bring me back to itself. And it was communicating to itself. And as it was communicating to itself, it was also communicating to me. And so it had this superposition thing going on. It was two things and one thing simultaneously. And I was two things and one thing simultaneously. I was inside of this entity being carried up where it spoke to me, comfort and and power and i could see out of and i was a parallel like eyeball in space riding independently from it looking at me inside of it so i can see the entity from the inside and the outside and i can see myself from the outside and i can see from my own inside to the outside world and as i looked over to see where this eyeball was of me seeing me i couldn't see that that was a higher, I was a higher order of my own self, watching my own self being carried back up into the divine being. And, and, and I had no power to stop or change or decide anything. This was all just being done to me. And I was like a, a stick in a river getting, you know, swirled under and just going for the ride. Nothing I could do.
It brought me up to what is what seemed to be its origin point where I first saw it, which seemed to be an edge of something. And 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 then it maybe unfolded itself and became larger or popped me out like a uh, uh, you know, a watermelon seed from your fingers. And, and I was inside a, a larger void. And this void was um, the whole fullness of the divine being mm. as a, a no thingness. Mm. There were no things there. And yet there was this fullness to it. And it was a darkness that was illuminated. And I could see in every direction at once. And I could see vast distance, a vast distance, the size of the cosmos distance. But there was a point at which I could not see beyond mm -hmm. where I was in a, in a darkness. There was a darkness that was, that, that I, I couldn't, I couldn't penetrate with my sight mm -hmm. and, and it was infinity. And so I'm inside of infinity inside, and I can see in every direction. And, and at some point all around me in this vast void, there is, there is, I can see the darkness that I can't see into. And I had t like 10,000 eyes or a single eye. And I was an orb of energy. My light body was gone. I was now in this expanded form. And that's so when I popped with this watermelon seed, the watermelon seed that left the fingers became something else. I became a, an orb of energetic consciousness where my seeing was myself. Mm -hmm. So when I see something, I am, I know that I'm not you. Mm -hmm. right? I'm sitting here and I knew I'm not you. Um, you're outside of me, but that's not the experience uh, that I had is that as I looked out, I was also made of the place I was in mm -hmm. and, and, and it was my home mm -hmm. and I was content and my seeing was my thinking was myself. And although I was, I was an, uh, uh, this gigantic orb of energy inside of this, the belly of God, I am still somehow part of it. Mm. I'm where I belong. It's my home with mm. a capital H. And I recognize myself as myself. Oh, this is me. How did I forget that I, how did I forget that this was me? I am so much more magnificent than the puny little human I was. And that, which I don't even care about anymore because now I'm back to my true self and I'm in my home and I'm content. And as I'm in this, this this vast v entity, um, I, I I'm I'm me. I, I, I no more suffering, no more pain, no more material, nothing material, no 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 thoughts to think in language, no concepts to grasp in my brain. All of these things were gone, and and I had an I had an identity that was. So, so and completely separate from everything as a human being and that my identity was me my real true higher self and as i was in this place of contentment um i saw uh, it the darkness the infinite darkness opened and light came in and this light came in like a and i i was ginormous and this was a much bigger like a waterfall like a waterfall the size of the largest waterfall on earth and and wider and taller and it is luminosity and it's and it has this flow to it and it's flowing down and it's coming closer to me and it's the most beautiful beauty i had ever seen anywhere ever and it is made up of all of the colors of all of the stars in the sky that night and stars aren't just white they are every single color and some emit uh, x-rays and and um and uh, infrared light and and so all of these full spectrum and more are all individual like scales on a fish of this flow of light and simultaneous to all of these individuated colors and pieces they are also at the exact same moment they are also made of white light all of them so the whole thing is is white light and colored light like light I'd never seen. And this, when I say light, I don't mean like the light over my head right here. It's, it's a metaphor for something that is much brighter and so much more attractive. And, and it's speaking to me. It's seducing me. It's calling me into itself as it's coming toward me. And I move toward it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I should also say I'm in timelessness. There's no 
Anything, the only thing there is, is now and all that there was and all that there will be and every single time space continuum are all present in this now. Mm. And, and it is so attractive that I touch it where it comes right up next to me. I move toward it and it moves toward me and it's gigantic. And I, I can see its surface and I can see its depth and I can see through it. And all of the, those sparkles of light, all those colors, I can see all the way into it. And I can see through those little sparkles of light that are these white and many colors and into a deeper tunnel. And, and it invites me inside itself. And I want it. I want it. And I touch it with my being. And as I touch it with my being, I open up. And it flows into me and it becomes inside of me. And then all these things happen at the same time. I expand, it surrounds me and it communicates with me. It talks to me. It has no voice, it has a voice, but no language. And it's right next to me, but I can't see it, but I can hear it and feel it from inside of me. And so it's somehow become personalized to have a conversation with me. I have to take a drink of water. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So this enters into me. And it's self evidently the divine. No one had to tell me what it was. It showed me in and of itself its own incredible, infinite power of knowledge, understanding, beauty, all life, all creator all benevolent, all protector, everything. It is all these things. It is trust and it's beauty and it's knowledge and it's all one thing. Mm -hmm. And as it comes inside of me, it shows me all these levels of myself. Mm -hmm. And I they all and it all happens at the same time. And so I I'll I'll talk about um I'll talk about my hell first because it's the human form of me. So as I'm there inside of it, it calls my name. Mm. But my name isn't a physical name. Mm. My name is unspeakable because there's no tongue there. Mm. There's no brain or ear, no ear to hear it, no brain to say it. And there was no tongue to speak it. But it call, it's calling my name and I am being brought into being continually. It's mm. always calling me into being and has been calling me into being since my origin and it shows me that it is creator and that i am creature and that that this this center of the center of myself is my true self and i'll come back to that in a moment because it's underneath and inside of what happens next and what happens next even though it, it's not really in a sequence inside my experience is um i went through when it calls my name of my soul self, it also calls the name of my human recent self. Mm -hmm. And it knows me completely, Peter, the human being. There's no part of my life that is not illuminated to it. I have no hidden dark corners, no secrets, no shames that I could hide, no regrets that, that were unavailable to it. It was a burning eye of divine light that saw all of me. And I was plainly naked in its presence and its overwhelming power. And, and it knew me. And as it knew me, it said to me, I have always known you. And it showed me not only my human self as being known, but my eternal nature as being known. And so, but in my human self as being known, I saw and experienced from the interior point of view of every person I'd hurt in my life, all of their pain. And it wasn't that I witnessed it from the outside, which I did also, and from my own interior, all of the pain, all of my reasoning and emotions that was, you know, I was deciding to cause this person, my sisters in particular, um, because they were the ones who I was closest to in my life. So they had a lot of, a lot of time in my chronology. And, and although it happened all very fast, I went through every individuated experience at the speed of time. Mm. And so I was inside of them experiencing their emotions and their reactions to my intentional and sometimes unintentional wounding of them. Mm. And, and as I suffered their pain and their confusion 
and their anger or their jealousy or their envy, lots of all these negative emotions that I was causing mostly purposefully. Mm -hmm. I had two positions at once. I was superpositioned between both of these things. I was myself seeing all of my reasons and feeling my emotions and saying the things I said. And I was them feeling it all. And the comparison between these two, the side of the woes who I wounded was 10,000 times bigger than any of my emotional uh, and reasonable, unreasonable attacks that I was making on them. And, and, and all of their pain was my pain. Mm. I gave all of their pain to me. Mm. All the pain that I gave them was mine. And I was, I was being shown, it was like um, it, the divine itself is, sees, knows everything and everyone and lives it with us, inside us. Mm -hmm. Like, and so it's you know, the book of life, the Akashic records, the whatever book you, however you want to talk about this thing. It is the, it is the experience of the divine experiencing our lives. Mm -hmm. And so there was nothing hidden inside of me. And, and as I went through all of this suffering and felt all of this accumulation of this karma, of this, uh, of my bad deeds, of my sins that I had, uh, had inflicted on other people, um, weighed on me and the weight on me as Peter, as the person going through this hell, um, was, uh, was this dark suffering of attachment to all of the things I had done. And it wasn't an attachment like I was choosing to be attached. It was like I had attached them all in my life. Mm -hmm. They were already attached to me. It mm -hmm. wasn't like there was a new attachment. They were already on me, in me, were me. And so when I saw myself as this, as the pain giver that I was, I also heard with this ineffable, uh, unspeakable love being spoken to me by the voice inside of me and around me. And it's saying to me, I've always loved you as you are. I have always known you. All these things that you did in your life, I have known them about you since the moment that you did them. I was with you when you did them. And I loved you in the moment that you did them unconditionally because I am you. Mm -hmm. I am you the love inside of you that makes you be. And it showed me all of humanity all mm -hmm. at once. And it showed me this radical equality of our of all of our brokenness in the context of a broken universe that is made of limitation uh, to, for its very existence to be in this, this time-space continuum. It, it can't be the purity of the being itself, which I could also see. And so I made this comparison of not just my own self, but all of, I was shown this comparison of not just my own self to it, but all of humanity to it and mm -hmm. all of creation to it. And I call it it because it has no gender. It's not male. It's not female. Call it mother if you want to, but there is, it is so far beyond any conceptualization of, of human, rational, experiential, knowledge it's ridiculously far away mm -hmm. and so i saw the this radical equality mm -hmm. of us to each other and that the comparison of judgment that we make human to human mm -hmm. even human to terrible human mm -hmm. to the worst of the worst of the worst is more equal to each other than my human nature is to the divine and so it left me with this understanding of my own brokenness in relationship to the brokenness of other people. Mm -hmm. And in this comparison, I judged myself. I was not judged. Mm -hmm. I was only loved. Mm -hmm. But I judged myself guilty of all the pain that I have caused, I had caused. And as all this was happening, I also saw my original self. I saw my, 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 my single photon image of God self, mm -hmm. where in the, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, it talks about how light from light and uh, image of God, light from lights from the New Testament, the Christian Testament, uh, the image of God. I was an image of the divine. I was a single photon. And in front of me was 
uh, a septillion times a septillion times infinity of all these photons and they were one thing and they were many things and they were a unified field and they were independent and i was outside of them this being was as as further than i could see in every direction um and in front of me up or down in front and i was outside it but but i was also a part of it mm-hmm. i was super positioned with us with it as if there was a a, a cable uh, mm-hmm. attaching me to it even though i had limited self and this limited self was my highest consciousness as a separate yet unified being with it and then below that i saw my soul self yeah. and my soul self was this big schmear like a like a huge french baguette and this huge long french baguette had a bunch of kebab spears and these kebab bamboo kebab spears are shoved inside of this baguette and and the kebab spears don't take up much space but there's a lot of them but there's so much more of the soul itself and all these kebab spears are all the lives i had lived and that none of them were me i'm the bread not the not the spear but the spear becomes part of my uh, self but it's not me Mm -hmm. they're all less me's and and it shows me inside of my lives i saw inside of two of my lives i asked can i see inside my lives and so i go from this superposition place down into the soul baguette and into the the spear and the spear is a human being Mm -hmm. and i'm inside someone else's body only it's my body and i'm walking on a dirt street and there's a palm tree and there's gravel and it's very it is like only one tree or maybe there's 10 trees but it's very arid and and i and i can see my feet and my feet are sandaled and i'm with a group of people and i got clothes on and there's you know and and we're not the only people on the road there's people walking by and there's you know vendors and and, and, and like people selling stuff and walking places and and then i'm out of that and then I'm into an, an an earlier life, another life. And in this body, I can't, I have no idea what I am. I think, I think I'm a lizard. I think my, my, my eyeballs are shaped differently. I'm seeing a world that I'd never seen before. There, I, my, there's a different kind of light. There's different kind of shapes. I don't know what the heck I am. I don't know where I am. Am I am, am, am a animal, a, a lizard on earth? Am I some other creature somewhere else? I don't really know. But, but I'm out of that. And neither of them were me. Mm. I lived inside of them. And all of this is happening simultaneously. And I see the long length of all of my lives right back to the origin of myself being called into being, which is always being called into being. And so this loaf of bread is always being called into being. And all of these lives, they're all happening simultaneously from my point of view. They're not in a sequence of time. I see them all at once. Mm. And then I, 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 and all of this is going on as I'm being shown myself. I'm also being shown my human self. So I'm, all this, all this layering is all happening simultaneously. And as I see then my current or my most recent incarnation, my human being self, I I feel guilt for having done all the things that I had done. And this all happens at the same time. And then the love that had been given to me in my life and the love that I had given away in my life also accrued to me. And it was through this ear of my, of love that I could hear the forgiveness that was being told to me. And it wasn't being, it wasn't forgiveness. If it wasn't conditional, it was always existent. Mm. This forgiveness was mine to choose. And I chose the love that had always been there waiting for me because it is eternal in nature. And, and I, I, I couldn't make any other choice. I don't know if other people can make a choice to turn away. I, it, the overwhelming power of the divine presence was infinitely more powerful than me. And uh, I, uh, once I could hear it speaking to me with more, uh, with additional clarity as all these things happened and I understood love and I judged myself as guilty and I saw its unlimited nature and its perfection in comparison with the structure of the molecular universe and, and, and and quantum physics and all the rest of that stuff, energy and light and, and all of that lesser material. When I understood myself as myself, I turned toward the love 
and it, it inflated me like a balloon. Mm -hmm. And I just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it inflated me with itself, as it came, as if it was like, it was like I was a hardened shell. Like, mm -hmm. like, like if you took a balloon and you dipped it in, in hot in liquid chocolate and you let the chocolate solidify and then you blow really hard on this balloon and you blow really hard on this balloon and eventually the chocolate shatters and it begins to expand. That's kind of what happened to me is mm -hmm. that, is that the divine fire of purgative love burned away the, the mm -hmm. chaff from my wheat. Mm -hmm. It released me from my own attachments mm -hmm. that were never me to begin with. And in this releasing of this, I was infilled with healing with a capital H that I can't tell you how incredibly powerful it is that I become my truest self. And this healing is wholeness and it's beauty and it's love and light and compassion and kindness and joy and uh, knowledge and, and understanding and intelligence and adoration and awe and glory and creation and, and benevolence. And it's all these things and they're all one thing. There's mm -hmm. these, these are all broken out in our world in these fragments but they are one thing. And this one truth, I'm expanding in this one truth and just more and more and more. And I am, I am in an ecstasy and a bliss and a paradise that is the, the end of myself. Mm -hmm. And I come to this place where, where, where the balloon is about to burst, where I can't, in, in this, in my own highest self, can't contain the infinity. And that as the infinity pours inside of me, I reach a limit before self-obliteration. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not Peter at this point. There's no humanness about me. And 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 I reach this this point of and I of 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 most beautiful tension mm -hmm. and and adoration. And mm -hmm. and then I retract. And I'm retracting back down now to this um relationship with my previous human self and so now i remember my life i just left mm -hmm. i don't remember the suffering and i'm not contained or bound by any of the pain that i caused i am still unbounded but now instead of being in this union state of being i am back to um, being able to think about my parents and the loss that i would be to them and i say to the divine without language because I don't have a body, mm. I say, "Am I dead?" And and the and the voice is like, "Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're dead." Um, and I I say, "Well, I can't go back now, because now I understand timelessness. Mm. I understand that my human life is the the wink of an eye." Mm. And and I say, "I can't go now." And the voice is, "But me." I am all there is. Come to me. I am everything. I am all life and all power. Come to me. And I say, well, you know, there's suffering and I, you know, and if I die, it's going to be bad for them. And because uh, of my sister and the, and, and then I am like, like this big, huge, this is totally metaphor. Everything I'm saying is metaphor, but this is really metaphor. It's like this huge hand comes down. Okay. There's no hand, but it's like this. And I'm like this little, you know, doll and it takes me and it's and i and it sweeps me across its own body mm -hmm. so i'm so this divine being that's manifesting itself to me and showing me itself is is also the space i'm in mm -hmm. it's not it's there's no differentiation between these and so i'm in i'm inside of it and it and it pushes me to the edge of itself to where the it empties itself where it lessens itself, where it becomes a limited form of itself as our universe, and it pokes part of my still celestial personage out into the universe, and I see all of our universe. I don't know how I can explain this to people. It's like a billion, 10 billion, zillion galaxies, and all of them have vast space between them mm -hmm. and i can see the space and i can see the stars and the nebulas i see every, i see everything and i see what i'm i'm not like looking okay i'm like i'm being shown and there's a very different thing it's like somebody's got you know, got my head if i had a head and it's like and my eyeballs are made to stay open and i'm be, i'm i'm not i have no power i can only see what i'm being shown and so i i i'm shown the origin of like i i'm on the edge of this time space thing 
And yet I'm looking back across time to the beginning of the universe. And I see the pre beginning of the universe. I see the big bang. I see the explosion of the, but it's not like I, I witnessed the, the bang itself. I witnessed the energy that is woven through the live time space that I'm in. That's coming out of the, that's emanating out of the darkness, out of the infinity that is woven through all there is. And it is love. And it is this great, big blanket, this woven web of love that permeates everything. And it's on it's all, the, all these different scales at the same time. It's in every single molecule. It's in every single quark. And yet it's also inside of planets and people. It is all these things, this big, huge web that's up and down and out and wide. And it's speaking to me love. Mm. And it says to me, I am all there is and I am love. And this love is the size of the universe times a bazillion, mm -hmm. because as it's showing me this love inside all things, it's also, I, I still can't see into the darkness. There's still infinity beyond my view, but out of this infinity is this universe after universe after universe, that's like an opening petal after layers of petals of, of flowers after flowers. And they're, and they're all different universes and they're all like, like the Lotus like you see the lotus flower in the in iconography, but it's like that, but it's just like constantly new universes and all of them are pervaded by the divine self of love, of infinite love. And as it shows me the creation of our universe in, 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 in as it is being created in the moment that I am seeing it and all this beginning of other universes as they're being created and, and they exist mm -hmm. and, and all of that love is aimed at me. Mm. I, it's like this big, huge lens is put in front of all of these universes and, and its focal point is my consciousness. And as it, as it, the light and love that is in all things pierces me and shows me itself, it says to me in non-language, ah, all is well, all has been well, all will be well, because I am everything there is. Mm. And I am in love with myself mm. and i love everything because i am love and I, I cannot not love myself i am all there is of love and it's aimed at me and i feel like i am the the most special being in all the universes i am the most beloved of all mm. and then it shows me earth sweeps me back my vision back to our galaxy to our star system to the earth and the earth is like, and it happens at once, just like that. And the earth is this, and it kind of comes into view at the same time, like, and, and, and it's this big, huge hologram and, and I can see through it and I can see every single human being all at once. And it's live time. It's like, uh, it's uh, and so so every i see i see people being people there are wars going on there are ships at sea babies being born people dying all the terrible things we do all the beautiful things we do all the boring things we do everything is happening in front of me and i can see all of it at once and i can zoom in on people and i zoomed in on this this ship in the middle of the Atlantic ocean. I don't know why I picked it. I could see it. I'm like, and I zoom into this ship and it's, and it's a, it's a, a vessel. And I see people and I go to this one guy and I see inside his heart, I see this golden light inside of him. And then my view is taken back out. And this golden light is like this, this fleck of gold, mm -hmm. this tiny gold dust speck only it's inside of every single human being. And it's, it's just because it's tiny, it's, it's brilliantly illuminated, like, like brighter than all of the suns. Its illumination is stronger than our star. And I see every single person is made with this love inside of them. And it's still speaking to me in the way that I love you now. I have always loved you and all is well. And I love everyone with the same love because I am them. And, and nothing is lost. And no one is lost. I cannot lose myself. Mm -hmm. And on earth, there was this big foam, this big like fog that covered, that, that went up to the level of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And and although I could see the light inside of everyone and I could see everyone's bodies with clarity, mm -hmm. I had because I had heaven vision, 
the nobody could see the light inside anybody else because of the fog. Mm. Everybody was blind to mm. the love that was inside it. Mm. And I, I now just in this moment, I'm like, well, why the heck didn't I ask why that was? I didn't. I don't know why I didn't ask that question. I'm like, that would have been a good question to ask, don't you think? <laughs> so that just occurred to me. So NDE, I'll take a break here and say that near-death experience is not just a one-time thing. You get your near-death experience and it and it keeps going. So my whole life, I'm living inside that space. And I'm always like thing, I'm always like having new questions like that one. Well, why the heck did I ask at the time when I had the opportunity? I have no idea why I did. But I didn't, but I could see suddenly my parents' faces. Mm -hmm. So out of this mass of humanity, I didn't ask, I was shown. And there, both of my mom and my dad show up and I can see the accumulation of all of their suffering since my sister left. Mm -hmm. And I see their pain, but it's not like I'm looking at it. It's like, I'm feeling their suffering. So I'm inside of them and I see their, their faces reflect also, they're like heads. They're like like the. You ever see the paintings, the iconography of of the of just the heads floating in, in angelic beings, kind of like that, just a head. And but I can see into them, and I can see all of their suffering. And then I see parallel lives. I see my mom and my dad living as a married couple without me in their life. Mm -hmm. And then I see parallel with that, the my mom and my dad living as a married couple with me in their life. And the difference between them was an immensity of pain. Mm -hmm. And so in, in the life without me, they truly break unrecoverably, especially my mom. And they live terrible lives. Mm -hmm. And in the life with me, they live a painful, difficult life. But in comparison, less. Mm -hmm. And then I see their deaths. I see their full life from that point to their deaths. And in their deaths, I see them as I see myself in heaven, mm -hmm. as well and beautiful and whole in this place of divine presence as the beloved, the most beloved. And that all will be well for them in the end. Mm -hmm. And the voice says to me, now you see, choose, come to me or go to them. Mm -hmm. And I say, can I come back here? <laughs> if I go to them? And the voice says to me, yes, you come back here. And I said, well, then I choose to live my own life. And the voice said, you won't live your life. Mm -hmm. And shot me out like a little pebble. And as I shot across the, the, the through, the, it was like these levels of descent, I guess, mm -hmm. like I, I, and of density and ac, uh, an accumulation of densities as I was shot back, but I wasn't alone. It came with me mm -hmm. in the form of this angelic being, which mm -hmm. is itself. Mm -hmm. There's no separation between them. And so this angelic being, my guardian angel, the one who has, who, carried me to a, a, out of heaven and spoke to me. And, in, and as it spoke to me, it said, choose. And in front of me appeared a million doorways. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of all of these million doorways was a single beam of heaven itself, of the divine light of intensity, kind of uh, beaming from heaven. And I wasn't allowed to look behind me. I tried to look behind me. I could see that the beam was coming. I could look only so far, but I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to see the origin of this light, which I knew was the fullness of the divine, because it's just, it's just evident. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and it, it filled the inner center doors. And maybe there was a dozen inner center doors, one in the middle, and, and then it began to fade out through the edges of these million doors. And, and the voice said to me, choose yourself. And I had to choose a self. And as I chose myself, I thought to myself, there are things that I want in my life. I want to be a creative. I want to work for you. I want to, I want to be uh, a little hedonistic. I want to have fun. I want to be, and all of these thoughts were one thing. 
and I made this choice. And in and in this definition of myself, I I was pushed to a door that was not one of the twelve doors or fifty doors or however many there were. I couldn't tell. It was too bright to see. Yeah. I couldn't see inside the brightness because it was too bright for my soul's eyes to see. All I could see was the density of the light. Mm. And maybe it was a single door. And the, the, and and I chose a door off to the side, not far away in the darkness, because there were doors where little light got to. But I, I chose one nearby, but not the thing itself. And in the instant of my choice, I was inside that doorway, shooting down this tunnel, still being carried by this divine entity. And all around me were doors. And it wasn't like a ceiling and a floor. It was like a curved tunnel full of doors. And all of these doors led to all of the other lives of there were potentialities for me. Mm -hmm. and, and inside of each one of these doors was, a, was another tunnel full of doors. Mm. and and as I, but i i traveled down this this path of my choice past all these doorways and i travel down and i see all this uh, potential lives i could live and it's not just the million doors it's mm. particularly the doors of that i could choose mm. i could see all the doors of my choices mm. and and knowing that each door of my choices led to other doors of choices mm. and so as i get to the end of this tunnel I'm now popped out into this universe and I'm kind of between the worlds again. I'm still being carried by the entity who's still loving me, mm. still communicating comfort to me. And then it takes me and, and I see my body and I'm lying <laughs> like, you know, and, and I see myself and, and it's and it, it's like a, like a, a blade hand into my 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 cervix here and 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 when it opens me up or and screws me in i my i know i told about two selves that it opened my physical body up and screwed my soul self which now has the this density of the being of my light being body and i'm being screwed back into this body again and all it does is hurt mm. it is i i had forgotten i, I I had forgotten suffering. I didn't understand suffering. When I, when, it, when I say it hurts, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't understand why it hurts so much. And then I was inside this shell, inside this, this containment, this prison, it felt like, and I could still see out this high-shaped opening in my heart. Mm -hmm. And I could see the divine entity, and I could see back into infinity, and I watched it go. And when it closed, I was trapped. Mm. And now I'm trapped inside this thing. And I don't understand what's going on. But my brain is already coming back online. And as it comes back online, feeling comes first, and all is suffering. Mm. I'm back inside. What is this place? Why am I here? Why? It, it, it's, this, God, it all this hurts. This whole thing hurts. It all it hurts. It hurts. Because I was in the place of no pain zero pain just wholeness and beauty and love the end of all of this and now i'm back inside and i don't understand what's going on and as my brain comes back online everything is hurting and everything is hurting and i hear sound and i hear sound and my ears sort of resolve into a more and more uh, a clarity and i hear yelling and screaming and sobbing and wailing and 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 i open my eyes to the screaming and i feel this i feel this thing being shaken and it's Tim and he's like right here in front of me and he's got me by the shoulders and he's shaking me against the rock and he's crying and he's crying and he's screaming and he's yelling, don't die, don't die, don't die. And then uh, he sees that my eyes are open. And he's like, I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. And if you die, I'm going to die. And he pulls me back up and, and he stands me up and he's like zipping my coat up and, and holding on to me and grabbing me by the shoulders. And, and he's talking to me and, and I have no idea who he is. I don't know where I am or what's going on. I, I hear language. I understand his words. I know what he's saying, but I don't know. I don't even know who I am. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm doing in this thing. And I don't know anything. And then it's like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. Memory starts coming online. Oh, yeah. oh, this is Tim and I'm ice climbing and, 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 and I, I died. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in shock because of what happened to me. He's in shock because he thought I died, but here I am alive. He's an atheist. 
So he does no afterlife for him and from his point of view. And and I I am not sure who I am anymore. And the the this radical sort of shattering, no, this radical shattering of my psychology left me selfless. Mm. I really I couldn't, I knew that I was this guy, but I knew that I wasn't this guy. Mm -hmm. And and so I was in this, this paradoxical place from the moment my eyes opened. And, and, and as I became aware of my physical surroundings, recognizing the mortal peril that I was in again, but not really caring about it anymore, mm -hmm. um, Tim said pull the rope i pulled the rope the rope came free and now i'm a totally level-headed i'm like back in my game and tim descends and i descend and i take over because i'm the first aid expert so instead of getting in the car and trying to like warm up really fast bad idea let's set up the tent and it's got a chimney and a vent and we fire up our stoves we get in our bags we we sip warm tea we go through this ritual of of uh, increasing temperature uh tea and hot actually it was just water to begin with just heating up the water and then tea and then food and then when we finally got to a place of enough warmth after an hour or two i don't really know how long we were in the tent for could have been four hours for all i know um the we we get in the car we fire it up and we heat back up again and then lots of other things happened Mm -hmm. um but during the night that i didn't tell anybody you guys about because it was trying to not make the story too long and uh, and then uh lots of things happened on the way home and my whole life became like for instance we ended up in jail and we totaled the car before we got back to montana and, <laughs> and my whole life has been like that ever since yes. i live i live in simultaneously in two worlds mm -hmm. i live and and I struggled against these worlds. Okay, I felt like I was exiled into this prison. Mm -hmm. I I agreed to this. Mm -hmm. I agreed to this, but I didn't. It took me a lifetime mm -hmm. to understand what that agreement meant, mm -hmm. and 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 why I gladly now am in the agreement. But for much of my life, I was in rebellion against it because mm -hmm. it, because everything here was a hellscape. Mm -hmm. everything about this place was hellish to me in comparison. Even I live in a most beautiful place. I intentionally live in a place that is extraordinarily beautiful because I need its soothing strength of beauty to survive here. Mm -hmm. I need nature to, to, to pray for me, mm -hmm. to be the energy of my own life. And um, that's been how I've tried to heal my rift this rift between that world and this world. And what I discovered is over the over a lifetime of, of Kriya Yoga practice, mm -hmm. of the centering of myself and the, uh, the elimination of my attachment to my false self through breath work, um, is, is that I can increase the capacity inside myself for the presence of heaven here now. Mm -hmm. And ra rather than pursuing trying to find it in the exterior world, I find that my only balance of my of myself in this exterior world is by being in time inside the eternal temple of my heart. Mm -hmm. And when I'm inside the eternal temple of my heart and I visit there regularly with my breath and my my practice of the end of my own self, I create a capacity inside myself by the nature of the practice of prayer mm -hmm. to have more heaven here now in my life so that it enables me to actually have a better footing in the world than I would have had had I focused on the external world to find my footing. Mm. Because now I live primarily, I, from the moment that I came back, if, if, if near-death experience is 50-50, no, if, if, if life is 50-50, mm -hmm. life and your afterlife is 50-50, but there's a, there's a doorway in between that's not open, mm -hmm. that you cannot see, and so you don't know the other 50% is there, yeah. uh, for me... I, the door is not only open, but I'm at like, I came back at like 60% on the other side mm -hmm. and, and 40% here, but it's, but it's much more intense than that. It never shuts off. It never goes away. And it, and it is insistent of itself. And mm -hmm. I found that if, if I, uh, the, the only relief I could get in the physical world 
mm-hmm. from the suffering world was by being inside the divine itself. And so my longing for it yeah. and my my anger at it for the detachment that I was suffering became my motivation for being in it. Mm-hmm. And so, so because I found nothing in the world, mm-hmm. there was nothing in the world that satisfied me. Mm-hmm. And, and although love poured through me, and out into the world, I fell. Here's the here's the, the the one of the problems that I faced early on. One of the after gifts of it is that I fell in love with everyone. Mm. I fell in love with everyone. Mm. Everyone I met, I was in love with. I would look into their eyes, and I would be in love with them. Mm. And that got me into lots of trouble with men and women, <laughs> and it became a troubled thing and mm-hmm. and 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 it wasn't just because they would fall in love with me it's because they weren't all good people mm-hmm. and i would love them anyway because i could see the light inside of them and i was falling in love with the very being of them mm-hmm. and it was i had to i had to learn to negotiate myself how to how to live in this world where 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 the value systems of the world didn't exist for me. It's not like I rejected them. It's mm-hmm. like all of the all of the idea of of belief. Mm-hmm. You know, so belief is based in language and culture and concepts. Mm-hmm. And concepts don't exist for me in terms of belief. Mm-hmm. They exist for me in terms of the definition of the of the life in the world. But when it comes to culture and religion and politics and all of these things that are human constructs. And all of the various language structures around the world, Japanese, Turkish, Greek, all of these warring cultures that are self-identified and their own religious natures mm-hmm. that are built upon these, these structural systems of language, they don't exist for me. Mm-hmm. They, I am not, I didn't reject belief. There is no belief for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have values and I act on my values in the world. But the human construct of all of these things are, they're not real. <laughs> the only, there's only one reality, and that's the divine. And so um, I found myself in a position of being uh, alienated from everyone, mm-hmm. unable to speak about the ineffable, because mm-hmm. it is unspeakable, and yet having to be in a position called to be a spokesperson for the unspeakable. Mm-hmm. And so I went into religion as mm-hmm. a profession. I became an ordained minister. I went to divinity school. I got my master's degree at Yale. And when I was at Yale, I studied mysticism. And although they didn't teach it at Yale, my dean of, uh, because it's a it's an analytical, the study of theology is analytics and systematics. So it's 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 the gathering of information and the systematization of that information, and that includes historical data and languages, and then it's the analysis of those systems. And um and so I got trained in systems and anal- and analysis, but I studied under the under one of the deans mysticism, and so I and I did a, dis- a, 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 a what amounted to a dissertation, but wasn't actually it was a it was the accumulation of three years of my studies in one paper for her. And I found inside the mystics of the Western church Mm -hmm. and the Eastern church, Mm -hmm. the same thing that I previously found before I went into divinity school inside the Quran, of which I am not a scholar, inside the Bhagavad Gita, Mm -hmm. inside the Upanishads, inside the, the Tao Te Ching. And then Jesus to me, As I read him, I went to a Catholic high school as a kid, and that meant that I read the four Gospels one a year, all the 9, 10, 11, 12 grades, and we studied them. And the Jesus that I met when I was in high school was not the Jesus that I was seeing in the Bible afterwards. The Jesus I was seeing in the Bible afterwards was someone like a near-death experiencer to me. Mm -hmm. He was articulating in language that thing which I experienced that nobody understood but the two of us. And so my peer group became all these dead writers from ancient history. And I chose the ancient mystical books because I figured they had more value. They've been passed down for centuries and that there was more likely to be unpolluted by individualistic perspectives if I dug deep enough into the life of the original mystic about whom the stories were written Mm -hmm. or about whom or who told the tales themselves. Mm 
And I found inside of those stories, me. Mm -hmm. And I... So you, early on, before we got on camera, I'm um, recording, you asked me to talk about my prayer life. Mm -hmm. And and so my, my prayer life, I I had been a, uh, you know, I've been a Catholic, I would grew up Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox. Mm -hmm. I have a Greek family and a, and, a, and a Western family and they got married and I was the oldest Greek boy. I went to both churches. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and as you know, they really don't get along in heaven for a thousand years, like they're enemies, okay? And um, and so I was raised with this contradiction in the middle of my religion, mm -hmm. and 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 what I discovered was is that inside of all of these structures and these institutions, way at the core of them and their original, maybe in in Christianity it might be the Aramaic and the Eastern Syriac Church, which has an Aramaic language Bible closest to the original language of Jesus, but I found inside of all of these religions, the yes. same singleness. Yes. They're all experiencing the divine oneness of being. However, they talk about this thing, that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so in my prayer life, I chose to choose the prayer lifestyles of those mystical geniuses who preceded me. Mm -hmm. And I ended up stumbling across uh, no, no, the stumbling is not the word, right word. In my path was presented the Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi and mm -hmm. the 25th chapter where he talks about Kriya Yoga. And simultaneously, I came across the Yoga Sutras. Mm -hmm. And the, tw the second section of the Yoga Sutras is a 3,000-year-old book still in print. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the sutras themselves are an accumulation of earlier wisdom going back who knows how long, 2,000 years. So... So 3,000 year old book, I, I, I saw that the emptiness of self and the end of the attachment to self in the way they described it, if one practiced breath and focus, one could empty oneself and allow the return of the self to the divine. And that's what I've been pursuing my entire life. In my own secret yoga practice, my own secret meditation practice, people knew I meditated, people knew I practiced yoga, but nobody knew what I was doing on my interior journey because I took the word, I did believe one thing. I believed that the, the, there might be a science to prayer that could enable me to get back home before I leave here. Yes. And it turns out for me, Kriya Yoga is the tool. And, and so I practice it practiced it with the with the practice of the end of attachment to self mm -hmm. these two things because i've been warned that it, one could acquire the divine energy and still have enough self to wreak havoc on people to be an unripe fruit mm -hmm. of the divine nature and still have the power mm -hmm. so if i was an if i looked like a a grape like we've got wild grapes down here and when they're at their ripest they're the most sour and distasteful things, but I, I sometimes can trick people into trying one. It's pretty <laughs> funny to watch their face. I had the same problem and it's no harm done, but it's, it's the consumption for others of unripe fruit. Yeah. And, and, and that, that I choose the vine that leads back to the divine instead, because I only want that one thing because mm -hmm. that is the only reality that there is. And so my prayer life is Kriya Yoga. Mm -hmm. And and that is a practice also that involves the repetition of a mantra, of a prayer, of a prayer chant um, that 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 with a focused breath that mm -hmm. trains my brain to stop thinking about myself. Mm -hmm. And um, and I found that over my lifetime, and I'm only now I've been doing this for forty years. There's a reason why. There's another reason why I chose this, and the the other reason why I chose this is because, and you are in France. And it was just recently Marcel Marceau's hundredth birthday, and and I I studied mime and yoga in his school in the United States. He taught students in France. They came to the United States, and this one guy Tony Montanero taught had a had a school of Marcel Marceau, and he taught teachers and he taught yoga, and as part of the mime practice. And so I learned yoga from my mime teacher, who also showed me prana showed me life force energy, showed me chi that I had this inside myself. I knew that it was there, but he, he showed me that I could capture it and hold it. And at the same time, I found um, Yogananda and the Pentajali and 
and and began then this long practice of a secret interior life, believing what Yogananda said, that, that there was a science to this, and that if anybody picked up these tools, there would be a, an, an inevitable result of divine reconnection. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted more than anything in my life was to get back to where I came from, because I hated it here. Mm -hmm. and and because of the suffering and the pain and and over a lifetime of practice and and, a, and the second near death experience uh, in between my second one in 2015 and my first one i i continued my practice of going deeper and deeper in secret i told nobody about my nde for 20 years i didn't tell anybody about my about my interior practice until about 5 years ago and and the the because i because i needed to wait to see whether it worked or not mm -hmm. and if it didn't work i wasn't going to be the fool to say I spent my life in pursuit of this thing that's not real. Um, and I waited to other people tell me that they could see it in me. And I know that it's not me. I know that it's not me because the practice of the end of self shows the original self and the practice. And that original self isn't just my my light body. It's not just my my original or, or my baguette. And it's not my 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 singular photon. It's the divine being itself that is inside of everything there is in and out of time. And so I live my life increasingly knowing that I'm in a timeline. I I, I know it fully, but it I, I feel my way into the the an increasing acceptance of my own more happy mortality. Because I'd been praying for my own death between my first and my second NDE every day, take me home from 80 to 2015. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. 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 Mm -hmm. Today, take me home. Mm -hmm. And and in that in-between space of my continued pursuit, mm -hmm. Because all I wanted to do was get home by any way I could, mm -hmm. I, but I couldn't kill myself. There was a, I was given a prohibition that I could not take my own life. Mm -hmm. And so I lived a lot of my life with suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. but also with this divine light inside of me saying, mm -hmm. and all of that went away in 2015 when I died again. Mm -hmm. And I came to this place of, accepting my life here in a full way that I had been in pursuit of for the whole time I'd been previously living my life 2.0. Mm -hmm. And and that the, the result of a lifetime of pursuit doesn't fix the world around me. It makes my world a magical place. Mm -hmm. It makes all sorts of doors open and other others close. It doesn't eliminate my pain. Mm -hmm. I still live my life. But it shows itself with an intensity of heaven here now, which is exactly what it turns out that Jesus was teaching in the Gospel of Thomas, in the Gospel of Mary, in the Gospel of Philip, and this Syriac text called the Peshitta, mm -hmm. and in the four Gospels overlaid with the Koine Greek, mm -hmm. separated from the more, more earthy original language. The, and and then interpreted over theologically mm -hmm. to create the divinity of Jesus' salvation for your soul, which mm -hmm. is not what he was teaching. He was teaching, you are the light of the world. If you make your inner eye single, your body will be filled with light. You'll do greater works than me. You will be one with the divine as I am one with the divine. And on and on it goes inside the gospel texts in the canon that are not understood, but are understood by all of the mystics and all of the history of all of the world who all know that they all spoke metaphor because once you're in the place of the divine union where there is no language and there are no concepts, there's nothing left to us but the made up languages of symbol and myth and metaphor and simile. And so then this confusion arises and religions solidify and they become power bases of understanding. And the, there's this, uh, and there's this other part. And this other part is, is that for the history of all humanity, the dead have been visiting the living. And in some religious traditions, that's acceptable. And in many religious traditions, that's not acceptable mm -hmm. because the, the people are afraid of the, of the, the, 
the powers that be are afraid of the influence of those mystical experiences that happen outside their purview. And so then what happens is, is that there are millions and millions of religious people and mm -hmm. non-religious people who have visitations from the dead, from their deceased loved ones, who come back to them and communicate whatever message it is they communicate. But with a, And often the message is love, and often it's well-being. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the person who comes back is trapped between worlds. And 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 then it's we can help them go back. But for those of us who've had the visitation that involve love mm -hmm. and light and well-being, that's a mystical experience that happens around the world through every culture. Yeah. And because it's a human experience. Mm -hmm. And that group of people uh, is an example of the presence of what they're being called spiritually transformative experiences, mm -hmm. but are historically mystical experiences where one has an experience of the divine. And then one's orientation is forever changed by the implantation of the unspeakable wisdom mm -hmm. that, that then reorients a person's life in some small or large way back toward the divine. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of the reasons why I, I accepted your kind offer to be on your show, uh, particularly because you come from a Turkish background, and I love Turkey by the way. Um, and I love the food and I love the people. I even danced the Greek dances that I learned as a kid at the Greek picnics. Turns out the Turks are doing them too. And I got to dance with the Turks in, which was just this ecstatic experience of cross-culturalism for me. Um, but the, but because the world knows this, mm -hmm. this, this truth is 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 the tr is the truth of the it's of the divine light inside of religion everywhere mm -hmm. and that there are carriers of this and there are opposers of this mm -hmm. and the people that oppose this probably had mystical experiences too but mm -hmm. don't know what to do with them mm -hmm. um and sort of like those people who are um hom homophobic because they're actually gay mm -hmm. um and the powered structure of the system in which they're uh, attached mm. prevents them from being truthful with themselves. Mm. And I, I want to, I want to, I want to, I use my near death experience voice to encourage other near death experiencers mm -hmm. to speak about it to someone you love and know, mm -hmm. and to help create a safe space. And I know that's a that's a hot button word for a lot of people but a place where it's safe for all people who've had mystical experiences, who've been repressed by religion and repressed by science, to have the freedom of speech, to speak about the truth of their lives that has reoriented them in the place that they're at. Mm -hmm. And not to proclaim it as that you must believe my way of being, but just to say, me too. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've had this experience too. And let's talk about it in the public square, mm -hmm. because it's 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 scientists mm -hmm. and it's astronauts and it's teachers and politicians and states leaders and janitors and house cleaners and and it's everybody. Mm -hmm. There are we are we are represented through every culture and every religion and every non-religion and every language and every strata of society and every financial bracket. We exist. Mm -hmm. And we are many. Mm -hmm. And to have our voice be able to be spoken, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's a question, what was this experience that I had? Mm -hmm. I don't understand what happened to me. Just bring the question to the public square mm -hmm. and let's have a global conversation. Because we are we're now in a very different history than humanity has ever been in the history before. We are shoulder to shoulder on a changing planet with and, and and there are more of us there's going to be eight billion of us coming up mm -hmm. and 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 our cultures are bumping up against each other in ways that they have always bumped up against each other and our tribal systems of 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 safety for our society for survival's sake but now it's a different planet and if we're gonna i have these books back here nudge and uh, i want I, i'd like to i'd like to see humanity have an opportunity to be nudged into a, a new self understanding. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not starry eyed enough to think that this going to happen just on its own. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen when all these nodules of individually optically uh, cable attached 
uh, people to the divine being, especially the end years who have, who know, who know through experience at a, at a baseline that their consciousness does not arise inside their brain. Mm -hmm. They know that they are from outside of themselves at that bottom baseline attached to this divine light. Uh, we have a, we have a chance that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's, and a nutshell, which took me, it's a big nut. It's a coconut. It's not an <laughs> almond and a coconut shell that, um, um, why I'm trying to spread the news of the divine light inside you is already there Yes, because we have a chance. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I mean, and this is actually the reason why I created this channel, a new way of being. And the reason why I wanted to, to have you as a guest is because, as we discussed earlier, um, I, I just wish that we, that there was no human being left in the world who still believes that God is an authoritarian father figure up in the sky who judges us and who orders us um, to dress a certain way, especially women, um, pray mm -hmm. a certain way, eat a certain way, fast a certain way. Um, because I notice how in my own country, in my own society, I mean, in Trevor society, there's there's always existed a schism between the secular half of the population and the religious devout half of the population. But you see how in religious conservative communities, women, yes, they do, they are under a certain pressure, more so than men, I find. And if they were familiar with your story and the stories of other people who've had a near-death experience, I, I think it would just benefit everyone. Um, I mean, this is a very sort of trivial sort of perhaps example, but Turkey is a beautiful country and toured by the sea of the Mediterranean Sea to the south, the Aegean Sea to the west, the Black Sea to the north. And come summer, secular families flock to the seaside. Men from religious conservative communities flock to the seaside and they bathe in the sea with their regular short sh swimming shorts. But the women, the veiled women, they stay behind in their Anatolian villages uh, because it's not appropriate for them to be wearing a bathing suit and bathing in the sea. I mean, women can do that because that's against God's will. So this is the kind of sort of belief system that these people are stuck in. And what I wish is by having these kinds of conversations, um, that we can sort of break those belief systems that that becomes the thing of the past that people can know that they, they can have god's love in their life without necessarily subjecting th themselves to these misogynistic quite frankly patriarchal um exactly belief systems um yes and then there were so many questions as you were speaking and, and sort of telling your story so beautifully um you know, sort of hell is often described in one Abrahamic religions, at least, if you take the information in the religious scriptures at face value, if you interpret them literally, hell is described as this place where there's hell fire, <laughs> but that's not hell. The hell... The, that... the, the fire that I experienced was cleansing. Yes. It, it was fire, but it was cleansing when I turned myself to the light. And and so it was this sort of necessary for me uh, release of myself. I have other I have other NDE friends, and there are tens of millions of us all over the world. Um, I'm sure, there are many in Turkey, um, but the my friends and acquaintances who've been through hell, those who went through the judgment of self, mm -hmm. my I self judged. Um, I was attached to things that prevented me from experiencing the fullness of love. When I, uh, when the light was offered to me, which was overwhelming in its nature, it's not like I could refuse it. Once it became visible to me, once I stopped looking at myself, its power was unavoidable, mm -hmm. beautifully unavoidable. And my release from my own hell that I constructed for myself as if it never existed. Mm. And it wasn't, it, 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 it wasn't eternal in its nature. It was beneficent in its nature. Mm. It was, uh, and not everybody I know who 
that has an NDE. Most people I know with an NDE, they didn't go through what I went through. Why did I go through that? I don't know why. I needed it, I guess. Mm -hmm. I needed it maybe for here. Maybe I needed it to be able to speak to it. So, mm -hmm. so NDEs, like all mystical experiences, come in as many shades as there are people. Mm -hmm. And no two are exactly the same. There are overlapping systems so or or types, maybe is a better way to put it. Um, but everybody's is individuated. And it, it seems to me, and I this this is speculation, it seems to me that the compassion of the divine is so great that it gives us what we need when we come back here mm -hmm. to live a better life. Um, um, so maybe somewhere along the way in the Abrahamic traditions, some one person went through a hellfire like I did, and then that became religion. Mm -hmm. and, and then it became a weapon for enforcement. I'll tell you what, you're all going to go to hell, and I'm going to tell you why I have the rule book that defines all the sins that you're going to commit that put you in the position of going to this hell. So, but, you know, lucky for you, I also control the solution. Mm -hmm. And so you buy your solution from me even as I give you the cause of the problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. And and then the power shifts to the one who controls those two stories. Mm -hmm. And there's no prison greater than the human mind mm -hmm. in a system of belief. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, all of the mystics in the history of the world, all of them, mm -hmm. if they were able to say so, and to your face, to my face, they would say that language cannot contain the presence of the divine and it is from language that religions are built and that the divine itself is a direct experience of the presence of this energy mm -hmm. itself in and of itself by itself for itself in itself of itself mm -hmm. and that, that all the rest of it is all construction upon that and mm -hmm. those constructions can help lead a person toward it mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they can't be it of itself and so therefore these structures become these rules and regulations that become a wall that actually prevent that thing from happening that they're supposed to be able to do and it's the most insidious sort of um hmm, satanically designed system mm -hmm. where the very thing that you think is going to lead you into the divine through a belief system turns out to be the very thing in your way mm -hmm. And and that that is a beautiful design. And then what, is it nefarious? I don't think so. Because I think all these systems develop out of our own individuated selves and our own self-identities and our as 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 a as a as a human being in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that survival dictates that we bond together in tribes that are bound by language systems, bound by cultural systems, imbued with religious systems for the survival of our species, our, our tribal species. Mm -hmm. And, and that all originates and the, and the, and the necessary self-identity of an egoistic mind in the world. Mm -hmm. And then power accrues to one person and their belief system or a group of people and their belief system becomes dominant but inside every single one of us mm -hmm. is the access to the very door of death. And this door of death is the same door that opens from the inside that the light comes through. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the practice of the elimination of self and through a meditative belief breath system is the death of self daily. Mm -hmm. And it, is, it reopens the door and opens the door and opens the door until the door remains open. Mm -hmm. And when the door, instead of glimpse after glimpse after glimpse, and an illumination after illumination after illumination, to varying degrees, the door stays open, and then the light just pours in of its own. Yeah. And, and and the light dispels the darkness. Yeah. I think, I suppose, also, the elevation of consciousness is more about undoing than doing more or l layering more. Um, it is, and it's not about knowledge. Mm. It's about beingness. And it is a practice. The Chinese have a term for that. Um, and it's wu we. It's not doing. And so it's it's the it's not. So I've spent my life essentially as a as a, a public scholar. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's what I've been my whole career, public scholar, and one, and sometimes a storyteller, a public scholar who tells stories based in, and so I've, I've been all about the accumulation of knowledge about mysticism. And so, and, and, and religious systems. And so I've accumulated all this knowledge as a tool set in my cultural context to try to say the ineffable thing that can't be spoken. Um, and so there's a there's there's a an advantage to having an accumulation of knowledge because it helps one understand oneself. So I'm continuing in my practice and I'm continuing to understand myself. And I have people who help me mm-hmm. understand my experience because they have language that I don't have. Mm-hmm. And so that helps me understand who I am in my context of my world, but it also helps me in my work. But I never confuse the two. Mm-hmm. The knowledge is not the thing itself. You can be an ignorant, illiterate, backcountry shepherd from the third century or the or uh, in the common era or or in the 17th century, you're a, a factory worker in some factory somewhere. It doesn't matter whether you know language or you know knowledge or not. If you spend your life in the in the negation of the self, you find wisdom. Mm-hmm. And this wisdom lodges itself in an accumulating fashion inside anyone, anywhere. And you don't even have to have a meditative life. You can live, you can be a mother with seven children, mm-hmm. and you spend your life in love with your children and in service to them, and you become enlightened as a result of your selflessness. Mm-hmm. And it is, it is this selflessness happens in the world and it happens in the interior self. And there's a symbiotic relationship between the two. Mm-hmm. The service to others and the elimination of self are the same thing. Mm-hmm. And um, you don't have to believe in God. No. You can be an atheist and do this. Mm-hmm. This doesn't have anything to do with belief systems at all. Mm-hmm. No, I think that, that what you're pointing to is actually, so because I didn't have a religious upbringing, I come from more secular media. My knowledge of Islam and Sufism is fairly limited, but I think that what you describe as sort of undoing the self or the ego self as least, is pointed to in the work, uh, works of um, Andalusian Islamic philosopher Ibn Arabi. Um, Ibn Arabi, yes. More so, yeah. And if I may say so, I mean, I, I wonder what you think about this. <clears throat> so a couple of years ago, just out of curiosity, <coughs> sorry, I got an English translation of the, uh, of the Quran. I was just curious what's written in this mm, book mm. that so many people speak of. Um, but as I leaf through it, I was a bit taken aback because it mentions hell, it mentions hellfire, it distinguishes be- between believers and non-believers. And to me, it felt like a very geopolitical text, quite frankly, a very, sure. very masculine in tone. Mm. And having listened to the stories of people who've had a near-death experience, I mean, God is neither male nor female, or both male and female, and God is love, God is unconditional love. So... How then to either symbolically interpret these scriptures, and this is valid for all the Abrahamic religions. Um, So what would your view on that be? I understand what you're saying. So um, there are sort of levels of mystical experience. Mm. And the the state of union of the, of the oneness of the divine where self is completely non-existent, which can happen in a near-death experience um, where you no longer have a body to identify with. So in some sense, you're always in this transportive state of, of um, deeper connection to the being, comes back through the filter of whoever you are. Mm in the context of your life. And if you are a narciss, a malignant narcissist uh, who likes, who has sociopathic tendencies that are biologically based, and we, we I think that both of those have environmentally uh, contingent aspects to their development in human beings, but they have bio, there seems to be, from what I read, I'm not a scientist in this, but from what I read, there seems to be biological bases for these things. Um, 
you can't change your biology. Mm -hmm. And so you come back into the body that you had before. I came back into the body I had before and mm -hmm. the context of my culture and the, and the context of my body is I'm a dyslexic. Mm -hmm. I'm missing a muscle in my left leg. I have ADHD. I have allergies. I have asthma. I, I have impulsive behavior. I have all these things that come along with this physical form that I have. And that is true for every ND ear. Mm -hmm. They come back into their physical body in the context of their brain and in their culture. Though people who have uh, visions of the divine, an angel comes to speak with them, haven't left their body. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're enveloped inside the radiance of the angelic form. Mm -hmm. And I think that Muhammad was in, God, you know, bless be Muhammad, peace be upon him, or however that's supposed to be said. Um, I think he was inside of the angelic radiance speaking to him. Mm -hmm. But it was also through his body and the cultural context of himself. Mm -hmm. And this is true for every single writer. Jesus was tossing over tables and some of the stories you you know he was killing trees mm -hmm. um and and you know wiping out entire villages uh, the livelihood of entire villages who made a living on raising you know pigs um it, it wasn't always peaches and cream with him mm -hmm. and i think that 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 his contextual nature was expressed was his his divine nature was expressed through his context and Muhammad's was expressed through his context mm -hmm. and 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 the, the there's no perfection mm -hmm. in the human level mm -hmm. and and I, I read the I've only read the Quran once and in English translation and it seemed to me to have geopolitical contextuality mm -hmm. Jesus was not is he had geopolitical contextuality as well and and so did every mystic who's ever lived in the outside world it's always in the context of your culture and so um you know muhammad he treated his wives well mm -hmm. from what i could tell he was a good husband mm -hmm. he he didn't live in a palace he lived among the people as a husband loving the women in his life um and the the and he lived in a warring time where enemies wanted to annihilate his people because of his belief system mm -hmm. and so um he was a warrior mm -hmm. he was a warrior mystic in the context of his time i I'm not a scholar of Islam, mm -hmm. but I see reflections of his humanity mm -hmm. and the context of other mystics in the world. Mm -hmm. Christianity has a very famous mystic uh, named um, Bless, Blessed John Roosbrook. Mm -hmm. And Blessed John Roosbrook falls into the mystical category of the love mystics. He spoke of love. And then when I read his writing, I see that he went to the place, a similar union that I was in. Mm. Lest John Roosbrook started the children's crusade. Mm. He's the one who sent the children to crusade against Islam, and they were all enslaved or slaughtered. Mm. And so one lives in a mystical life with contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I have had the contradiction of living with my own physical life in the in my own lifetime here, and so and I, I, I forgive my mystics many sins because I too am a sinner, mm -hmm. and instead I find that the light that they brought inside. The, their own being to be the factor of their truth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actively reject all the parts of the Bible, of my cultural context, that are not that thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not, I, although Jesus is my main teacher, I'm not a Christian mm -hmm. because I'm not a believer. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad, he wasn't a Muslim. He wasn't a believer in Islam. 
he couldn't be. Mm. He experienced it directly. Mm. And then he put it out into his cultural context. Mm -hmm. um, and then a religion was born. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm really hoping that we don't do this time, mm -hmm. that near-death experience does not become a religion. Mm -hmm. um, in all of the religious texts, there's always light. I have a book over here somewhere. Someone sent me. Um, this is it's called my Mer my mercy encompasses all the Quran's teaching on compassion, peace, and love. It's mm -hmm. sort of all the. It's like it's sort of like the collection or a collection of all the things that I'm looking for as a biblical scholar that I'm seeking to find the wisdom that's that's hidden inside the scriptural texts of the West, mm -hmm. and and I look for them. I use the East as well. I'm not you know I'm not just exclusively West, but that's where my training is. Mm -hmm. So that's where my largest scholarship is. But um, these ex these sorts of things exist. Mm -hmm. um, and they exist in the Quran, these, these, wis these pearls of wisdom of light. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus was the first, person, the first one to talk about love. Mm -hmm. He was not the first one to talk about light, but he's the first one to talk about love. And I think that there are cultural, I think that culture grows. Mm -hmm. I think that religious spiritual culture grows and he added this new element that muhammad didn't have mm -hmm. buddha didn't talk about love buddha talked about compassion but mm -hmm. he wasn't talking about love confucius he wasn't talking about love lao tzu wasn't talking about love um jesus kind of brought that into the the zeitgeist the the whole you know subconscious of of spirituality and um so now all of uh, many, 70% of near-death experiencers in a, in a recent study uh, talk about light and love, mm. but maybe they wouldn't have talked about love pre-Jesus mm. because the Upanishads, I'm sorry, one last thing, the Upanishads recommend against talking about love. Mm. Now, this is where I want to ask about the second coming of Jesus Christ, whether that's the physical return of Jesus Christ on earth or, well, I, I live in a, in a state in New England, in the United States, and it's called Maine. And Maine has a famous American cult mm -hmm. of, they're called the Millerites, mm -hmm. who expected Jesus to come for them. <laughs> and the Millerites gathered from all over the eastern part of the United States. And they and this is in, in, in you know, post-colonial Maine in the 1800s. And um, and they got, they gave up everything, they gave away everything, and they waited for Jesus to come, and he didn't come on the night. Of, and then the, the cult leader's like, yeah, you know, I, I guess I, I, I got to get through my calculations again. No, he, he's coming next year. <laughs> so, um, and in and, and, and the history of Christianity, and I know Islam has their own mythology around the return of Jesus, and in the, in the Christian tradition jesus comes on a trumpet and he beats all his enemies and it turns out that's the same tradition in islam um they have the same tradition but they're on opposite sides of that battle and and um and that's been true of all the cult leaders all down through history who make some proclamation that the physical jesus is coming and it's a it's 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 um uh, what did Karl Marx call it? It's opiate of the people. It's the opiate of the people. It it lure, it lures them into believing that there's that basic and they look at their scriptures and they say that you know these things are gonna happen, but they really don't know because they're making this up as they go along in their interpretations and they miss the message in the first place. And the original message isn't that I'm coming back on a horse to beat my enemies on either on both sides of this battle, this epic battle. Um <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have two selves and I'm going to hate every, I'm going to, I'm going to equally hate both sides um, is that uh, it was never about that. It was, it never left. He, it, so in the Christian tradition, there's the, after he dies and he raises and he's, and the disciples are gathered in this room and it's called Pentecost in the Christian tradition. Basically it's, it's the remaining 12 men and women actually there are women there okay but it only talks about the men okay so um right and so the 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 people are gathered and the what's called in the christian theology the paraclete mm -hmm. it's it's the comforter 
And this comforter is the promised one of peace. Jesus says, I'm going to send you the comforter. You've, you've in the, it's more, it's more accurate in the Aramaic, the mm -hmm. Syriac Aramaic, where Jesus is talking about the, the, the radiance of his very presence is the message itself. And that while you're in my presence, you experience the radiance of my interior self with you. But when I die and go away, don't worry. There's going to be this other experience for you that uh, the comforter is going to come. And the comforter comes because it is the same substance as the divine glory. It's always the same being. It's in everything there is. And, and it becomes in this concentration because they've been with him and they've felt it inside him. And they've created capacity inside them for the presence of this being inside them. And this paraclete comes in the comfort and it's present in the world. And, it, and they go out and they speak on it. And this comforter has been coming to anyone everywhere for the history of humanity who's been in the presence of the divine through the emptying of self because it is everything there is. It's always here. Mm -hmm. It's never not been here. It's always here. And so the the coming of the divine consciousness, the Christ consciousness and, and the sub... So Christianity has lots of... Uh, uh, fragmentary fra fragments of it and one of the fragments of it talks about the christ consciousness that lived inside of jesus which mm -hmm. is the same divine e energy some call it the universe some call it uh, the the Tao. Mm -hmm. some call it chi some call it shakti some call it allah mm -hmm. some call it the name <clears throat> this divine energy becomes dominant in a person or a group of people mm -hmm. And the group of people who are existing now are science, medical science driven near death experiencers. And mm -hmm. so one of the biggest, hugest differences in the history of the world is that science is creating a culture of mystics, yeah. like all over the world by the tens of millions. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's this extra light that's coming in. That's never been here before because human beings are born with two doors and the one, be, the, we don't even know that there's a door behind us. We don't know that all it looks like is darkness, but it turns out that there's two doors and this one opens and we don't even know this one is here, but eventually this door can be opened. And when this door is opened, the light pours into the world through this door. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, there's this awakening and so we are actually this, I know that where this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This is my generation of the, the hair of the song. And, 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 and it's not about the alignment of the stars. It's not about the believing of anything. It's about the presence of the being itself, which is beyond belief and beyond the universe. And now it has an avenue in through us as channels. I am a channel. I've spent my life to become a channel of divine heaven. First, it was for, for my own well-being and survival in the world mm -hmm. so that I could like, how do I live in this place? And, and then uh, it for the sake of others. And we're all like this. And so near-death near experience as a social and cultural global phenomena through medical science, technology is sending people as theonauts, like th like astronauts into heaven and coming back each with their own experience. And this is a global sized awakening and it couldn't come at a more perilous time in the history of humanity. As we bump up against each other, we've, we've geo engineered the earth. We've re geo engineered the earth and, and that has consequences. And if anybody who pays attention to historical science and you know what happens when the oceans rise, everything changes mm -hmm. and that is happening to what extent we don't know. But I live in a place where I live here in Maine, we have the earliest spring we have ever had. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's been getting that way in, in, since I've lived here. Yeah. And so, um, and we have geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And we have religions against each other, but all of them come down to the idea that consciousness arises in the human brain mm -hmm. and it does not, it inhabits the human. Mm -hmm. And when that shift is understood by enough people and we can talk about it publicly in the public square, which is why I agreed to this interview, because I want this in the public square. It is, it is ginormously huge mm -hmm. and it's it's the biggest it's the biggest event that nobody knows about in the history of humanity i mean ai is a very large it is a promethean moment for human beings in addition to the climate geoengineering we mm -hmm. have ai and that is a promethean moment for us mm 
um, in terms of our self-understanding. And I'm interacting with AI. I know you are. We talked about it um, because this is very, very world changing. And here we are all the tens of millions of near-death experiencers and all the many tens of millions of more people who have an intuitive understanding of this or who have had their own spiritually transformative experience who are all over the world and are repressed by religion and have been repressed by science and unable to speak about it except for to their dear ones, never talk about it in the mosque, never talk, never talk about it in church, never talk about it in places of spirituality because it, it upsets the divine no, it upsets the social structure and the power dynamic. Mysticism abhors institutionalization. Mm. It is, I, it is, it is subjective. It is personal, and when it becomes that, you have to believe me. You mm. must believe me because because I need you to believe me to reinforce my own self identity. Mm. When that need is eliminated, I don't need that. Mm. I don't. I don't ask anybody. I don't care. I mean, I care, I care enough that I want to be able to make a living. Mm -hmm. uh, I care enough that I want to have some, and I've spent my career building my credibility. I have a very credible career behind me, and I did that on purpose. I have this super credible career because I knew I was going to destroy it as soon as I came out as a mystic and started talking about this stuff, that I was going to put my professional life at risk. And so I wanted to prove that I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a can-do kind of guy. Yeah. And um, so- but but I don't really care if anybody believes me or not, because I know who I am. I know where I'm from. I know where I'm going. I am a temporary person in this world. I've always been a temporary person in this world. I know that about myself. I can't wait to go home again. But in the meanwhile, uh, that gives me courage here to say what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And because and I don't need people to believe me mm -hmm. because I know who I am. And it's not like I know it in a belief system or I know it like like I learned it in school. Mm -hmm. This is a, a fundamental aspect of my whole self that mm -hmm. is that is my own identity beyond this life. And and I'm not the only one like this in the world. Mm -hmm. We are there there are there are there are more people like me. Um and there are people who have varying degrees of this of a similar experience of of a touch of the grace of the divine where in this moment you know that you're not this person anymore when the dead come to visit you and you see that they are alive and you and you and you have this experience it transforms your understanding of the solidity of the world mm -hmm. and now you know that it's not and when that happens there's no going back you can't unlearn this kind of wisdom. It sets you in a new perspective. And we are legion across the world to take a favorite phrase of mine from Jesus that's applied in the negative. So this is the, to say this is a negative sort of statement in Christianity. To say they are legion is, is, is a reference to the presence of the divine that's not in the control of the religious structure. Mm. Um, and um, it's not. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, mystics historically have been dangerous, and many of us has been isolated. Uh, and, and within traditions, there are mystics living in traditions, um, or they're hated, or they're or they're or they're sent out, or they're killed, or mm -hmm. they're institutionalized these days, um, because mystical experience is one breath, one hair's breath away, one hair's width away from insanity, mm -hmm. because it sets you so far outside the world so as to destroy your psychology. Mm -hmm. And then when my psychology has been repeatedly shattered through these mystical experiences, it has to reconstruct itself again and reconstruct itself again. And I'm born again and again and again and again. And it, and it turns out that the thing that I feared the most, which was the, very, the, the destruction of my self-identity, of my psychology and the world, it turns out that the less of there that is, the more I am actually myself. Yes, yes. And the thing that I feared was the thing that I turned out to be the best thing for me. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, just rewinding a little bit. I mean, we see a rise in the number of, in the world, but also in my country, in Turkey, we see a rise in the number of people who identify themselves as deist or spiritual, but not religious. And, but these are people who actually question the most and who um, have a sense of morality and ethics. And I don't know if you know, but there is currently uh, an Islamofascist regime in Turkey, 
It's a I do know that. It's a despot one-man regime. And the current minister of religious affairs, he's been denying in the media, no, no, the number of deists in the country is not rising. But because they have a vested interest in sort of keeping these religious structure and influence of religion in place, because that's what they derive their power from. Um, so you see this happening in one country, Turkey, but it's, it's very sort of palpable and visible, actually, but it happens on a global scale, too. Um, happened in con under Constantine. That's what happened to Christianity. Mm. That's how why Christianity is the way it is. It's, it, it's an expedient political tool. Religion is an expedient political tool for authoritarianism, and it's happening in my country right now. Yeah. And um, there, is a, there is a large movement for that. And, um, and it's all based in this, in this insular, uh, self-reflective, feedback loop thinking contained in a, in, a, in a religious structure over which is built authoritarian power. Mm -hmm. and, when, and when belief becomes the, the truth, instead of the truth being the truth, the, the light, then it becomes a weapon mm -hmm. because it, it has to deny the very thing that it's supposed to point to in order to stay in power. Mm -hmm. And so the repression of the, of the spiritual or the denigration of them or the, um, the, the uh, vilifying of them mm -hmm. um, becomes an expedient tool down the road. Mm -hmm. and, but you can't stop. You can't stop this thing. This is the more, the more people who die in Istanbul and are brought back by cardiac care in that singular population, the more NDEers there are. And the more NDEers there are who are talking about this to their neighbors or the people that they love, even, even, when it, even, in the, even the imam can have this experience. There's some imam somewhere in Turkey who's this happened to, who's keeping his mouth shut, yeah. but he is not the same person anymore. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's unstoppable. Mm -hmm. It is unstoppable because it's medical. And mm -hmm. because it's medical, it's everybody. And because it's everybody, it's everywhere. And the, the people who, are, who haven't had those experiences, who, 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 who perceive intellectually the power structure of, the, of the, a very useful, very historic, regularly uh, designed power structure of religion and politics to run a despotism, a despot. Um, it, it, and, and sometimes on a small scale and sometimes on a empire wide scale, um, it's all about belief systems mm -hmm. and you can't stop people from seeing the truth when they're thinking about it mm -hmm. and feeling the repression. And, but when the power's in their hands, the money, mm -hmm. the military, the yeah. belief system, the control, it's, um, you can only break it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will, I'm glad you're spreading that. I don't speak Turkish. And if I did, I would have, mm -hmm. because I would love to see you interview Turks who have had near death experience. And mm -hmm. um, you put yourself, if you do that, you're by doing it in English, I think you're keeping off the radar a little bit, but, but I'm not so sure you'd be putting yourself and uh, you'd be putting yourself closer to the radar. You'd be, you'd be a more, you'd be a bigger a bigger item on the radar if you're talking in Turkish. And I, I know this because I'm doing this in, in English. Mm -hmm. And on my own channel, I don't get attacked. Mm -hmm. But on other people's channels, I get attacked all the time. I get called all sorts of terrible things. I'm on people's radar. Uh, my, my government doesn't really care about me. Um, and, um, but there are, there are religious people who do mm -hmm. because I am not teaching their, as they say to me, you don't teach my Jesus. Mm -hmm. You're not teaching my Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for noticing. Um, the, but I'd love to see you. I'd love to see this in every single country. I know that there are people in Israel producing these programs in Hebrew. I know that there are people in Iran producing these pro programs in, in um, what do they speak there? Persian mm -hmm. or Persian. Um, and so I know that there are people in these countries doing these things because it's real mm -hmm. um and and if this ever gets off the ground for you and you end up talking and speaking in turkish um, um there's a place for you at the international association for near-death studies groups mm -hmm. there's a there's a where we are in, we are an international group of mm -hmm. science-based they're science-based i'm not i love science but i'm i'm nde based um mm -hmm. and it's a 
we are we're we're many and more all the time mm -hmm. um and your people in your country who are seeing through the veil of the falseness of the power structure and and identifying as deists mm -hmm. or or religious of uh, spiritual and not religious um if they look inside themselves they'll begin to see what they're seeking mm -hmm. and and that is the place that it's universally true and you could be a shaman in northeastern Siberia and have the same truth revealed to you because you carry this golden thing inside yourself, which is the truth of your own beingness. Mm -hmm. um, and um, watch out for the people who prey upon those who seek. Yeah. And they're not there. There are they're out there mm -hmm. who uh, want who want you and not who. I don't know. They want they want something other than the oneness of being, whatever yeah, that is. Certainly. It's some kind of selfishness. Yeah. No, it it serves, it always serves power structures to have a common an enemy, actually. Mm. Yeah, it sure does. Hey, I should probably go soon. My the sun's gonna go down fairly soon here. Yeah. And I need to get my my well, I've got a couple hours, but I gotta get stuff done. Yes. I mean it's been a couple of hours actually. <laughs> In the meantime, Peter, I'm infinitely, infinitely, infinitely grateful we've had this conversation. I mean, you've poured your life force energy into this. It was such a treat to listen to you. Um, I hope we'll get to speak again sometime in the future. Me too. Um, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm absolutely grateful for um, you um, shared all your wisdom and insights with us, with me. I'm, I'm, I'm. It's my it's my job. That's why I'm here. <laughs> You're a light um, bringer. <laughs> and I'm a light bringer, and I'm at peterpanagor.love, and that's where <laughs> you can find me if you want to if you want to find me. Please, yes. How can people reach you? Uh, Peterpanagor.love. I'm on YouTube. I I have a, a podcast. I do lots of interviews. Um, but my Peter all of the linked peterpanagor.love. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Peace to you. Good to meet you too.